Good evening. Very thankful for Josh's ministry. Thankful for a music ministry that represents not only musical skill, but theological depth. Aren't you grateful for that? We ought not to take that for granted. We ought to thank the Lord uh, for him and his leadership, but also from time to time encourage him with the knowledge that we recognize that and give thanks to God. I will apologize in advance uh, for my voice, either what it is or what it may become, because I'm fighting a, a sinus infection and uh, prayerfully the Lord will give me oxygen enough to uh, keep a voice throughout this evening. But I'm excited about looking at Psalm 51 with you, so if you would turn there please, Psalm 51. And we're going to read the entire psalm tonight. We will stop our study at verse 9 and then finish next Wednesday evening, Lord willing. Psalm 51. The superscription reads, To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time tonight in His Word. Father Heaven, thankful for my brothers and sisters, thankful to be with them, thankful for their love for you. Lord, that's your work. And we recognize that and we give you praise that they love you and they love your Word because they love your Son. I pray that tonight as we open your Word together, you would grant us understanding. Lord, an understanding that goes beyond just intellectually grasping what we'll see. An understanding that will affect our attitudes and our wills, our motivations, our desires, our ambitions. An understanding that would move us to 
not only be flooded with thankfulness for your grace to us, but also with that desire to turn from sin in all of its forms and to confess our sins and to turn from our sins and to receive the forgiveness that you've given us in Jesus and to walk in the freedom that Jesus died for us to experience. Lord, I pray that you would bless tonight in, in such a way that when we leave, we will be mindful of you, thankful to you, focused on you, and ready to serve you. We do pray for anyone in our midst who doesn't know your son, and our desires that even tonight would be the night that they would meet him and be saved. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I come to this psalm, the only way I know how to express what I feel is to say that this is a big psalm. It's big in every way. It's weighty in the sense that the vision that it gives us of sin, of the confession of sin, and of the God who forgives sin is larger than we can really get our minds and hearts around. We can be thankful for this. This big vision of God is the biblical vision of God, which is to say it's the true vision of God. This is who God really is. He's making himself known to us on the pages of, of his word and specifically in this psalm. We need that big God because sin is a big problem. It's a bigger problem that I'm afraid we're we're always aware of. The superscription, as we read a moment ago, it informs us of a sin issue in David's life that was enormous. You can read about it in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. David, as you know, had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And when he discovered that she was with child, then he moved to cover his sin. And David's attempt to cover his sin included putting her husband in a battle position on purpose that resulted in his death. David made a choice right in the face of Uriah's loyalty to him. David made a choice that resulted in Uriah's death. So that as David expresses in verse 14, he, he now stands before God in blood guiltiness. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. Murdoch Campbell had this to say. He said, David had committed two sins for which the Mosaic law provided no forgiveness. For deliberate murder and adultery, death was the inevitable penalty. He knew that before God there was no forgiveness through any sacrifices which he might offer or any gifts which he might present. With Micah, he could have asked the solemn question, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No, by such offerings God cannot be appeased. David might have said, if I build him a house, a magnificent temple, if I plead my hitherto circumspect life and all my good deeds in his service, will these not compensate for my lapse and restore me to his favor? No, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There is but one way back to God, and David knew it. It is through the merits of the Lamb of God. The enormity of David's sin was something he was now very, very familiar with. We need to be familiar with the enormity of our sins. We need to be convinced tonight as we look at this psalm that it's not just sins like David committed that are a big problem. It's not just the sin of adultery that's a big sin. It's not just the sin of murder that's a big sin. All sin is a big problem. As Josh mentioned tonight as he led us in that song, the cross testifies to the enormity, not only of God's grace and mercy and love, the cross of Jesus Christ testifies to the enormity of our crimes. Because nothing less than the death of the Son of God on the cross could ever have atoned for the crimes that you and I committed. All sin 
is a big problem. Any sin calls for the wrath of God, fully deserves the wrath of God, so that all sin is larger than our ability to remedy. It's all stronger than our ability to conquer. That's what this psalm testifies to. And it answers the question, where do guilty souls turn for forgiveness? Maybe I'm speaking to someone tonight that you're weighed down with guilt. You sit here this evening and your sins loom large in your mind. They weigh heavy upon your heart. You're living right now in guilt. Where do guilty souls turn for forgiveness? Is there a place where we can turn? Is there a place where someone who is broken hearted because of self-inflicted wounds? Is there a place where they're their heart can be mended by merciful hands. Where is the second chance, proverbially, proverbially speaking, where is the second chance that we need when, in fact, we know it's not just a second chance. These are multiple times that we have failed, multiple times, innumerable times, that we have violated God's word. Is there a place where we find mercy? Is there a place where we can find real freedom from guilt? Freedom not only from sin and its penalty, but freedom from the guilt that weighs us down. Is there a place to turn? This psalm answers that question. So tonight and next week we're going to look at this psalm under five headings. And so what I did, I don't normally do this, but I gave you an outline. You can follow along with me. The front side of that page we'll cover tonight. The next, the other side of it we'll cover next week. The first thing we see is in verses 1 and 2. We see from David a cry for mercy. A cry for mercy. Verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now I just I want to remind you again, I just want to set this before you again so that you can hear this psalm for your life, for your heart, for your guilt, for the things that weigh you down. I do want you to remember the superscription. What David is looking to God concerning for, concerning his need for mercy. In other words... I want you to see the enormity of what David has done so that you can recognize that no matter what it is that you have done, if you look to God in the way that he did, you can find what he found. And in the very first line of the psalm, when he says, Have mercy on me, O God, right there is the sinner's only hope. It's our only hope. I wonder if you recognize that tonight. Do you recognize that apart from God's mercy, there is no other hope for us? There is no other hope for sinners. We are completely dependent on the mercy of God. There is no hope to be found in our good works. All, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. There is no hope to be found in our good intentions. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, the Bible says. There's no hope to be found in our very best efforts because our very best efforts fall short of God's perfect holiness. No, the only place we can turn to have a right standing with God, to, to know the forgiveness of our sins, is to look to God's gracious character. And to recognize that what God has done because of His gracious character, because of His mercy, He has actually taken steps so as to be merciful to us. Again, a very timely song that we sang tonight. There is no mercy from God apart from justice on the part of God. For God to extend mercy to us, our sins had to be atoned for. They had to be answered for. So God actually, in His gracious character took action so as to be merciful to us. And that's why we can look to His mercy. 
I mean, think of it this way. Why would anyone dare to hope in the mercy of God? Whoever gave us the idea that we could appeal to the mercy of God? Where did we ever get the idea that, that the creator of us is a merciful God? Well, the answer is he's revealed this about himself, hasn't he? I mean, there's our joy. There's our hope. When David cries out, have mercy on me, O God, he's crying out to a God whom he knows to be merciful. He knows the character of God. How does he know this? Because God has revealed this about himself. Just one example, the Lord told Moses about God's gracious nature and character. Exodus thirty-three eighteen. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he, the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Isn't it interesting? Moses says, will you show me your glory? God declares his name, which is to say his character to Moses, and the place where he begins is his free, sovereign grace and mercy. God is gracious, but he is free in his granting of graciousness. God is merciful, but he's free to show mercy to whomever he desires. Exodus 34, 5, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Isn't it interesting? The Lord uses those three terms. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. And you listen to the words of David. And what is he asking for? The forgiveness of iniquity and transgression and sin. And the Lord goes on to declare about himself. But he will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children. And the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. God is a God of mercy. But he's also a God of absolute justice. And how did Moses respond to that? Verse 8, And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. You see, you can't worship God unless you can accept these truths about God. So David, knowing the truth about God, has this as his request, Would you be merciful to me? Have mercy on me, O God. Which is to say, to be gracious would you be gracious to me? Would you extend the, the kindness of mercy to me? And if we ask, what specific kind of mercy does David have in mind? Because we know this. God, God shows all kinds of mercy. Right? I mean, every day in this world, he's being merciful to lost people. The sun is shining. The rain falls. They take air into their lungs. Their heart is beating. Those are undeserved mercies from God. These are sinners deserving of the wrath of God, and God is good to them. That's a mercy. But David has a specific kind of mercy in mind. He's talking about the mercy of forgiveness. The mercy of forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. Three powerful requests. First of all, we see the, the enormity of sin in these statements because he talks about transgressions. That is, willful rebellion against God. A willful violation of God's laws and commandments. This is, this is the rebel action that is being envisioned here. The action of a rebel. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. That has to do with guilt. Guilt. And he says, cleanse me from my sin. A general word for sin there. So just 
in general, missing the mark, falling short of what God requires. What is he asking God to do? He's asking God to blot out transgressions, wipe them away. Yeah, that's the language of a record book. Lord, would you, would you remove from the record my acts of rebellion? He says, wash me. That, that, that's the language of, of the cleansing of someone's clothing, for example. So, so now he's envisioning someone, not a record book, but someone who stands before God filthy. Filthy, defiled. Uh, when he talks about wa the washing here, the words used in Exodus 19.10 for the washing of garments. He's saying, I'm dirty, I'm impure. And it's not some superficial washing that he desires. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. A complete washing. And then he asks in verse 2 to be cleansed. And that word emphasizes ritual purification. So he says, I'm, I'm guilty. I've committed acts of rebellion. Lord, would you remove that? Would you forgive that? He says, I am impure. Would you, would you wash me thoroughly? And then he says in this third line, I'm unfit. I'm unfit. I, I am disqualified for your acceptance. I am unfit for your presence. And what he's asking God to do is to show the mercy and graciousness of God in the complete forgiveness of what he's done. That is scandalous, isn't it? That is scandalous. In fact, we could ask this question, how would someone in David's position, doing what he has done, committing adultery, taking a man who is so loyal to you that when he returns home from battle, he doesn't even go to his wife. He, he, set, he, sits, you know, he, he takes a guard position regarding you, and you have that man murdered. How dare you now approach the Lord and ask Him to forgive you for this? How do you ask for mercy in light of these actions? This is the, the scandal of the gospel. This is what lost humanity finds itself offended by. You ever met an unbeliever that's offended by the concept, the, the Christian biblical concept of forgiveness and salvation? Not too long ago, a couple of years ago, there was a man that Roman Catholic background, asked me if I would go play golf with him. We went, and I was, I was really thankful to God, so kind of blown away, because he asked me so that for 18 holes he could talk to me about the gospel. We had played flag football together. He had heard me share the gospel. His father was near to death, so he just wanted to talk about the gospel. And through that four-hour time together, where we, where we finally arrived was he told me, I just cannot believe that forgiveness is offered in the way that you say the Bible describes. I just, I just can't believe that. Offensive, outrageous, they think. They're unwilling to extend that kind of forgiveness to other human beings because they've never seen that they need that kind of forgiveness from God. You see, the self-righteous, uh, those who imagine themselves to be morally upright. I don't need a scandalous kind of forgiveness from God, and so I don't extend a scandalous kind of forgiveness to others. This is how the unregenerate mind, the darkened mind, thinks about itself and therefore about God and about others. No, David, David is asking for something that's scandalous, but notice he has a reason for this. He has a reason for this. Verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, here it is, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy. 
How does David have the audacity to approach God for mercy? Because he knows something of the character of God that is amazing. He says, according to your, and it's that word we've talked about before, chesed. He's talking about God's covenant, keeping, love, and faithfulness. Now the fact that David would appeal to God's covenant kind of, of love is a reminder to us that he understood that God's relationship with his people Israel was in fact a gracious one. It's true that there were temporal punishments and, and the discipline of God was associated with the Mosaic Covenant. If the people violated that covenant, God would discipline them and, and do so severely. But the promises originally made to Abraham were unconditional in nature. God had graciously chosen this people and had related himself to this people. It was an unconditional choice on the part of God. And David understood that same truth with respect to individual salvation. It is, it is a matter of grace. It is a matter of God's doing. So that David is saying, in effect, I appeal to your unconditional love for me. I, 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 I am asking you for mercy and forgiveness, knowing how you love. Knowing that you're faithful to remember your people, you don't throw them away. Knowing of your unbelievable grace to me, your abundant loving kindness, I ask you for this mercy. According to your kind of love, God. Your steadfast love. And then he says, according to your abundant mercy. And in that word mercy is the thought of compassion. He appeals to the very heart of God. He understands God to be full of pity for his people. Mercy, compassion. Can I ask you, do you conceive of God as being a God who delights in compassion and pity and mercy? Do you understand God that way? Do you see Him that way? When you think about your own sinning, do, do you run to the Lord confessing your sin, looking for forgiveness, assured that He is a God who has loved you unconditionally, who has chosen you by His free grace, and He is full of mercy and pity and compassion towards you. That's what David's appealing to. I wonder where he ever got that idea that God is a God who delights in mercy. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 says this, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice and holding fast to Him, for He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. What is the Lord saying? I've set life and death before you, and I am exhorting you, pleading with you to choose life. This is what I delight in. This is what I want. That you would love me, that you would obey me, that you would hold fast to me. So that when one of his children has gone astray and they recognize it and they desire to turn from their sin and turn to their father, turn to their God, they need to know this is what God delights in. That his children would turn to him. Look to him in their sin. For the forgiveness that God has taken action to provide. I wonder, do you see David's sin as larger than yours? Do you see what he has done as more scandalous than what you have done? That somehow his sins deserve the wrath of God, but your sins don't quite deserve the same kind of wrath? Do you need as much mercy as David? Do you need as much compassion as David? So we see the cry for mercy. 
The second thing we see, verses 3 through 9, is the confession of sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. You see, if you just heard the first part of this psalm, and you just heard what I said in verses 1 and 2, you might think that it's possible to, to think of God as loving and compassionate and therefore to take sin lightly. Do you, do you think this vision of God as full of love and compassion means that you're going to take sin lightly? If you think that, then you haven't read this psalm. You see, the reason why God's love and compassion has to be great is because our crimes are great. In fact, I can say to you this way, compassion is only necessary because God is fully committed to justice. Think about it. If God is a God who is not just, if He's a God who's not really holy, if He's a God that you can sin in His face without any fear of repercussions... You don't need mercy. You don't need compassion. But if God is the holy and just and all-powerful God that He's declared Himself to be on the pages of His Word, then you need compassion. You need mercy in sin. David doesn't conceive of his sin as something small. He sees it as something that's needing the mercy and compassion of God. If you and I think of our sin as something small, we'll never see our need for grace. We'll never see our need for God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. We'll never worship God as holy. We'll never really be thankful to God for the grace that He has shown us. You see, if, if my sin is small, then God's grace to me means very little. But if my sin is enormous, an infinite kind of insult to a God of infinite holiness, then if God has chosen to extend grace and mercy to me, my heart needs to be flooded with thankfulness. Oh, that God has shown me grace and mercy. That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. In fact, it's interesting, in, in both the Old and New Testaments, Whenever the Lord enlightened someone to His holiness, it always meets with their humility and their confession of His holiness. Let me just give you one example. Luke chapter 5, verse 5. Remember Peter, other disciples out in the boat fishing. They fished all night. They've caught nothing. And the Lord then speaks to them. Simon, he tells me to cast on the other side of the boat. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when, when Simon Peter saw it, Right? He witnesses this miracle. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Wow. I mean, what did catching fish have to do with his sinfulness? Just this. He just got a big view of who Jesus is. He just got a big view of the fact that Jesus, Jesus 
is holy and he is God. He has these miraculous powers that only can be explained by the power of God. And so depart from me. He's overcome by this sense of his own unholiness. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. So when you get this big view of God, his love, his compassion, his justice, therefore our need for his grace doesn't make you treat sin lightly. It brings you face to face with your sinfulness. So what do we see in David? We see, first of all, the depth of his sorrow. Notice the depth of his sorrow. His sins are large, aren't they? He says, I know my transgressions. I know them. What does that mean? I see them. I see them, God. In fact, not only do I see them, I see them all the time. What I have done, what I'm seeking you right now for forgiveness concerning... It is, it is always on my mind. It is, it is always weighing upon me. See that in verse 3? He says, my sin is ever before me. And the word translated ever there is a word that means continually, constantly, regularly. He can't escape it. He's seeing it all the time. And I wonder who's giving him this vision of his sins. Who has brought his sin out so that he can see it as he sees it? Well, we know who does that. The Lord has done this, which is why he can, he can ask the Lord later on in the psalm to, to heal him. He says, you've crushed my bones. The Lord's hand is heavy upon David. He can't escape his sins. And now his conscience is sensitive before God. His sin is a plague to him. Sin is large. God is holy. If you're going to confess sin, not only will you have to see your sin, you have to see your sin against the backdrop of the holiness of God. Because notice what he says in verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I have committed evil acts. See, he's not, he's not lowering the bar, is he? I've committed evil acts and I've done them before your face. You have witnessed it. It has been in your presence that this has happened. Which helps us to understand what he means when he says against you and you only have I sinned. He is not at all excusing himself for what he's done to Bathsheba or excusing himself for what he did to Uriah. We know this because of what he says in verse 14 when he asks for deliverance from blood guiltiness. That has to do with the, the human view of this thing. I'm a murderer. I am guilty of blood. He sees that. It's not what he's saying. What is he saying? I have come to see that the sinfulness of sin is that it's against you. What makes sin most sinful is the statement that it makes to God and that it makes about God. And you and I are not really at the place of confessing sin until we have made that connection. That the sins that we commit against people are sins committed against God. First, foremost, most serious. We sin against God. That won't make us heartless toward people. That will make us care about how we treat other people. Our sins against people are sins against God. And those sins that you commit in your thought life and those sins that you commit in the realm of your, your motives and those sins that you commit with your body and maybe you've said to yourself, this isn't affecting anybody else. Listen, you're sinning in the presence of God. It's against Him. So where real confession is taking place, sin is not small, sin is large, and God is not small, God is holy. Holy, holy. And all my sins are committed right before His face. Do you know what that leads to? No more excuses. You see verse 4? Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I'm going to call this what it is. I've done evil. So that, here's what this means, you may be justified in your words 
and blameless in your judgment. I think there are two thoughts wrapped up in those words. One, the words of God concerning what David has done, David says, are perfectly right. No excuses, no justification, no more cover-up. He has brought his own sin out into the open. The Lord has done it. The Lord has given him the knowledge of it. But the knowledge of it has resulted in this. David confesses his sin. Calls it what it is. Sees it in the light of the words of God. What you say about what I have done is right. You are justified in what your words have said. But the second thought is, here's what that means. Now, my life is in your merciful hands. And whatever you choose to do with me in light of what I have done, let me put this on the public record so that no one will ever say that David has been mistreated. However you respond to this, God, you are right. You are blameless. I'm the one to blame. I'm the one who has sinned. You are justified, and I am wrong. It's very interesting to me. When you read this entire psalm, David is not asking for deliverance from the repercussions of his decisions. He is asking for deliverance from his guilt. He's asking for forgiveness. Can I, can I ask you, when you confess your sins, what is most on your mind? What might happen because of what you've done? Or the fact that what you've done is evil and against God? And what you long for more than anything is forgiveness. Sin is large. God is holy. Excuses are abandoned because His sorrow is real. It's deep. But notice that David recognizes something else. Not only the depth of his sorrow in verses 3 and 4, but notice the depth of the source of his sinning, the depth of the problem. He recognizes this also, doesn't he? Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. What is David saying? There's a bigger problem than what I've done. The bigger problem is who I am. This just manifests a bigger problem. The problem that has been manifested in my case is who I have been since the day I was conceived. In other words, David goes from saying I have sinned to confessing that he is a sinner. You see, this is when the Lord has really opened your eyes to your sinfulness. It's not just this conversation you shouldn't have had. It's not just this behavior you shouldn't have displayed. What you become aware of is the real problem is internal. It is in your heart. It is in your life. And you recognize that this is not just true of you. There's something fundamentally wrong with the whole human race. It extends to each and every one of us. Which means the depth of the problem, it's so, it's so deep, it extends to the man himself, but it's also so deep that it requires a solution larger than any human being can accomplish. Because what does God delight in? You see, my sin goes all the way down into me, verse 6, so what does God delight in? Truth, where? In me. He's not just asking for some sort of superficial, external purity. What God delights in and desires is a purity that is in the heart. Truth in the inward being. God must produce what God delights in. God must produce what God delights in. Lord, I'm not just asking for forgiveness. I'm asking you to change me. 
to produce in my inner man what delights you. You see, you, in verse 6, must be the teacher. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. You must be the teacher. Even what David is seeing right now, who's taught him this? The Lord has taught him this. You've shown me this, God. You've brought this before my eyes. This never, ever takes away our personal responsibility when it comes to our sins, but what it does do is it points us to our absolute constant need for God if we're going to live lives that please God. God must produce in us what He delights in. And isn't that what He does? He grants us a new heart through regeneration, new birth. But the flesh is still present, so there's still an internal problem. And we find ourselves battling against sin and failing and needing the, the fatherly kind of forgiveness that involves the enjoyment of fellowship with God. We, we are in fellowship with God through His Son, but now to enjoy that fellowship, there's ongoing confession and ongoing forgiveness, the fatherly kind of forgiveness. And that means we've got to look to the Lord to produce in our hearts, because that's where the real problem is, to produce in our hearts what pleases Him. Hebrews 13, 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. I love this. He's just stacking up those terms. Before I ask you for anything, let me remember who you are and what you've done for us to save us. May he do this, verse 21, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight. That's sanctification. God working in us. Are we working? We are working. Are we putting forth effort? We are. But we are completely, constantly dependent on God for that work so that He's working in us that which is pleasing in His own sight through Jesus Christ, always flowing out of this atonement and this union found in the Son of God. End of verse 21, Hebrews 13, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, that's why our salvation is to the glory of Jesus Christ forever. From Him, through Him, to Him is everything. He saves us, keeps us, goes on saving us, and will save us. We look to Him constantly. You can't live your life apart from dependence on the Lord. So, you see the depth of David's sorrow in verses 3 and 4 as he pours out this confession. You see the depth of his insight into the problem. The problem extends all the way back to when he was conceived. The problem is in him, and he's asking the Lord to produce what God delights. He delights in truth in the inward being, and God must be the teacher of that kind of a heart. Finally, verses 7 through 9 we see the desire of the penitent sinner. So what does, what does David want? He reiterates. He reiterates what he said in verse 2, verses 1 and 2. He says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my sins iniquities. What does he want? He asks really for two things. He asks for something for, that has to do with how he stands before God, and he asks for something that has to do with what he experiences within himself. How he stands before God and what he experiences within himself. He has a desire regarding sin. He has a desire regarding his senses. And if you just reflect for just a little bit on when you are overwhelmed by your sinning and you approach your Father for forgiveness, you know both of these desires. Not only to know that you are forgiven, but to feel that you're forgiven. 
What does he want regarding his sin? He wants to be cleansed from his sin. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was used in the application, the sprinkling of blood, the application of atoning blood. So David is looking to the atonement. And he understands the blood of bulls and goats won't take this away. So he has a big view of, of God and salvation, the need for grace and mercy. I need to be cleansed based upon the atoning blood. And notice that in each of these statements is not just a desire, there's faith. Because he says, if you purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me. That's what he asked for earlier. Wash me. And I will be whiter than snow. This is what he wants. He wants to be forgiven. End of verse 9, blot out all my iniquities. Same things he asked for earlier. And he knows that if, if this is granted, he will really be forgiven. But do you notice his second desire? This has to do with his senses. This has to do with the experience of forgiveness. He says, verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let me hear it. What does that mean? Let me hear it. Let me hear joy and gladness. It's as though what David pictures here is a return to the community of worshipers. Lord, in my sin, it's like I stand outside. I hear their joy. I'm aware of of the joy of your people. I've known it in my own life, and now it's like I stand outside. I long to hear the joyful voices of those who accept me into their presence. Derek Kidner said it well. He said, there's no need to substitute fill me, RSV did that, for the Hebrew text, thou shalt make me hear by which David seems to picture the outcast return into society, greeted by the sounds of welcome and festivity. It's like the prodigal son returned home. Oh Lord, can I know joy again? Can I know joy again? He wants to join the joyful. He wants to join the healed. Verse 8, let the bones that you have broken... The Lord has reproved him. The Lord has laid his heavy hand upon him. You've crushed me. Would you let my bones rejoice? Kidner said that in that word rejoice, in that Hebrew word, may be also the idea of dancing. And so the picture is, is almost of a, of a healing that has occurred. My bones have been crushed, but now I long to dance with joy in the knowledge of your forgiveness. You see, if, if the Lord is the one who makes us to feel our sins, then He's also the one to make us feel our forgiveness. He makes us feel our sins. Oh Lord, now would you make me feel my forgiveness? He longs to join the peaceful. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins. You know that... that that sense, that feeling that there is your sin before the face of God. Oh, Lord, that you would look at me in such a way that you would not see my sins. Clean, whiter than snow, nothing on your record. How's that possible? The gracious nature of of God, the compassion of the Lord, the gracious power of God to show you your sin, to bring you to the place where you look to Him for the forgiveness of your sin, the gracious saving act of God, because without the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, there would have been no remission for sins. Can I ask you, have you ever looked to Christ for the full forgiveness of all of your sins, all those crimes 
that made the cross the scandal that it was and is? Do you recognize that the forgiveness of believers is scandalous? We, the sinners deserving of the wrath of God, have been completely forgiven and set free because God's wrath was poured out upon His Son. So that now when we as believers fail, and because we are believers, we are grieved to the core and sometimes shocked by how sinful we still are. Do you know, are you assured that you can appeal to God based upon His faithful love and His abundant compassion to, as a Father, cleanse you, wash you, forgive you, and grant you the joy Again, that you lose when you choose sin. Who tonight needs to run to the Lord for His mercy? Who has been living in sin and you are miserable? The Lord has laid His heavy hand upon you. And you need to stop excusing it and justifying it. You need to call it what it is. It's evil. And you do it before His face. Would you fall on your knees and say, Oh Lord, I'm a sinful man. I need mercy. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your precious promises. Your amazing grace. Above all, Lord, for the perfect Son of God who in such mercy and compassion and love stepped out of heaven and took to Himself a nature just like ours without sin and lived the life we can't live and died on the cross in our stead and has been raised from the dead so that we can look to, to Him even as You sanctify us and bring us all the way home you have forgiven us completely and yet we need ongoing forgiveness in that sense of, of fatherly forgiveness and the forgiveness that allows us to rejoice in the fellowship that we have. Oh Lord, I pray for your people tonight. God, that wherever they have been dabbling in sin and excusing sin and living in ways that we were not saved to live in, oh God, bring us to that place of real confession. And I pray for any guilty soul in this room or listening to my voice who has never looked to your son's perfect, atoning sacrifice for a right standing with you. Maybe they've thought their sins, Lord, to be small. I pray that tonight their sins would be large in their own sight, but that your grace would be larger in their sight. And they would look to Jesus and be saved. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.